Hello and good afternoon. My name is Christy McGavro and I am on CDC's COVID-19 Community Intervention and At-Risk Task Force. I would like to welcome you to this CDC stakeholder call within a series that we are calling Helping Communities Plan For, Respond To, and Recover From the COVID-19 Pandemic. Today's call is focused on youth sports. We would really like to thank you for all of your, all that you are doing and to help protect your employees and communities, including children, during this unprecedented time. This call will be recorded and later posted on the CDC COVID-19 website. This call is not intended for media. If you are media and you have questions, please direct your questions to media at cdc.gov. I also want to make just a couple of logistical notes. There will be no content slides during our speaker's remarks or for the question and answer session. So what you see on your screen now will remain for the duration of our time. At the end of the presentation, there will be a couple of slides that include the URLs for some resources that our speakers will refer to today. While you won't be able to click on the links themselves, you can snap a quick picture of the slides so that you can refer to the links later or note that all of these resources are available on our COVID-19 website. Our plan today is to hear a situational update from a leader in our response, followed by details on youth sports from a subject matter expert. We'll then have ample time for questions and answers based on questions that people have submitted in advance of this call. I am so pleased today to be joined by Dr. Carolyn Wester, Dr. Jill Darty, and Dr. Jennifer Murphy. Dr. Carolyn Wester is the Director of the Division of Viral Hepatitis within CDC's National Center for HIV, Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention. In this role, she oversees the design and implementation of national programs for viral hepatitis prevention, control, and surveillance, and outbreak response. Dr. Wester is currently supporting CDC's COVID-19 response in the role of Deputy Incident Manager, which includes oversight of the Community Intervention and At-Risk Population Task Force, which is where the scientists who developed the Youth Sports Guidance sit. Dr. Jill Darty, our subject matter expert on this topic, is an epidemiologist, an epidemiologist currently serving on CDC's COVID-19 Community Guidance Team within the same task force. We are also joined today by Dr. Jennifer Murphy. We have received numerous questions from many of you um, about cleaning and disinfecting during COVID-19, and Dr. Murphy is the lead of the Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene Team within CDC's COVID-19 response, so we're so glad to have her here to help answer your questions. Outside of the response, Dr. Murphy serves as CDC's Environmental Microbiology and Engineering Laboratory Team Lead in the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch. And with all of that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Wester to share a situational update on the COVID-19 response. Great, thank you very much, Christy. Across CDC, we are working closely with the White House Coronavirus Task Force and other federal partners to slow the spread of COVID-19 and ensure that communities remain safe, healthy, and resilient. There are currently 57 jurisdictions reporting COVID-19 cases to CDC. This includes all 50 states, D.C., New York City, Commonwealth Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Navajo Nation. As of today, there are just over one and a half million confirmed and probable cases and over 94,000 deaths in the United States reported to CDC. Reopening America requires all of us to move forward together using recommended best practices and maintaining safe daily habits in order to reduce our risk of exposure to COVID-19. CDC is actively engaged in the whole of government plan to get and keep America open safely and efficiently. Mitigation and containment of COVID-19 is essential to get and keep America open. And CDC is committed to leveraging our expertise and partnering with others on the front lines as they make decisions about community mitigation efforts. CDC is continuing to provide guidance and implementation tools to assist state and local partners and other stakeholders in making decisions about adjusting mitigation strategies to protect public health. I'm pleased to note that CDC has published a variety of resources to support reopening efforts. These include decision tools focusing on a variety of venues. Updates also include additions to the document titled 
CDC activities and initiatives supporting the COVID-19 response and the President's plan for opening up America again. And that URL will be provided later, as we just heard. That document includes two new appendices to assist public health and government officials in making decisions on when and how to reopen communities and specific settings. I'm also pleased to note that earlier this week, CDC released health considerations documents to help businesses and community organizations operate as safely as possible during the COVID-19 pandemic. These documents support summer camps, schools, institutes of higher education, restaurants and bars, and of course, the setting that you have called in today to hear about, youth sports organizations. CDC previously posted health considerations for operating aquatic settings, which might be especially of interest to youth swimming and diving organizations. The considerations documents complement other CDC resources, including interim guidance documents that are posted online and the decision tools that I mentioned earlier that help inform community setting um, decisions about resuming and gradually scaling up operations. Together, these critical resources are intended to help communities plan for, respond to, and recover from COVID-19. CDC will continue to update these resources to help state and local leaders as they implement, adapt, and adjust COVID-19 mitigation strategies in their communities. I wanna emphasize that none of the, these resources supersede state, local, territorial, and tribal public health recommendations. All of these resources emphasize the importance of working with appropriate health officials and adjusting to meet the unique needs and circumstances of the local situation. Decisions and strategies about how to operate are implemented at the state, local, territorial, and tribal and local levels because every locale is different and individual jurisdictions have the authority and local awareness needed to protect their communities. We know that the topic of youth sports is top of mind for people as summer is approaching. We have received multiple requests from partners and stakeholders regarding youth sports. I'm glad to have Dr. Jill Doherty from our community guidance team within CDC's COVID-19 Community Intervention and At-Risk Task Force here with me today, virtually, to discuss considerations for youth sports organizations. Before she begins, I'd like to just put in a plug for actions that everyone can take to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. The best way to prevent infections is to avoid being exposed to the virus. Here are some of the steps CDC recommends to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. First, wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially before eating or preparing food, after blowing your nose, coughing or sneezing, or after going to the bathroom. If soap and water are not available, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Always wash hands with soap and water if hands are visibly dirty. Two, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Three, avoid close contact with people who are sick. Four, stay home when you are sick. Five, cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue, then throw the tissue in the trash, or use the inside of your elbow to cover your cough or sneeze. Next, Wear a cloth face covering in public settings, especially when social distancing measures are difficult to maintain, like in a grocery store or pharmacy. But do not ever place a cloth face covering on children under the age of two, people who have trouble breathing, or anyone who cannot remove the covering without assistance. Next, clean frequently touched objects and surfaces using soap and water, and then disinfect using a product from EPA's List N which is disinfectants for use against SARS-CoV-2, and practice social distancing. This means maintaining at least six feet of physical distance between you and other people in community settings and staying home as much as possible. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Doherty, who will provide an overview of considerations for youth sports. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wester. As Dr. Wester mentioned, I'm going to be speaking to you today about some considerations that youth sports programs can think about as they put in place plans to resume youth sports safely during COVID-19. A general principle to follow is, the more people a child or coach interacts with, the closer the physical interaction, the longer that interaction, and the more sharing of equipment there is by multiple players, the higher the risk of COVID-19 spread. Again, I would like to reiterate that all decisions should be made locally in collaboration with local health officials 
who can help determine levels of COVID-19 community transmission and the capacities of the local public health system and healthcare systems. Given that, our considerations generally fall into four topic areas, promoting behaviors that reduce spread, maintaining healthy environments, maintaining healthy operations, and preparing for if and when someone gets sick. So I'm gonna address the first area first, promoting behaviors that reduce spread. There are a number of behaviors that youth sports programs can encourage to help lower the risk of COVID-19 exposure and spread during competition and practice. These include considering educating staff and families about when individuals should stay home and when it is safe to return to youth sports activities, teaching and reinforcing hand washing, not allowing spitting, and encouraging covering coughs and sneezes, teaching and reinforcing the youth use of cloth face coverings among coaches, staff, officials, parents, and spectators. Face coverings may be challenging for players, especially younger players, to wear while playing sports and should not be worn by children aged two years or under or anyone who has trouble breathing. Supporting healthy hygiene by providing supplies, including soap, hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol, paper towels, and tissues. And lastly, posting signs in highly visible locations that communicate how to stop the spread of COVID-19, properly washing hands, and properly wearing a face covering. The second area that I wanna cover is maintaining healthy environments. To maintain healthy environments, youth sports programs may consider cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces or shared objects and equipment at least daily or between uses. If playing inside, ensuring ventilation systems operate properly and increasing circulation of outdoor air as much as possible. Taking steps to ensure that all water systems and features, such as drinking fountains, are safe to use after a prolonged facility shutdown. And modifying layouts to promote social or physical distancing. This may include spacing field positions or drills at least six feet apart, discouraging high fives, handshakes, fist bumps, and hugs. And if keeping physical distance is difficult with youth players in competition or group practice, consider relying instead on individual skill work and drills that allow more space between players, providing physical guides such as signs and tape on floors or playing fields to ensure that coaches and players remain at least six feet apart may be helpful. Closing communal use spaces such as locker rooms, if that's possible, and ensuring adequate supplies to minimize sharing of equipment as much as possible or limiting use of supplies and equipment to one group of players at a time and disinfecting between use. Third, to maintain healthy operations, there are a host of things that youth sports programs may consider doing including offering options for individuals at higher risk, such as virtual coaching and in-home drills that limit players' exposure to others, identifying small groups and keeping them together, which is sometimes referred to as cohorting, avoiding group events such as games, competitions, or social gatherings where spacing of at least six feet between people is difficult to maintain, designating a youth sports program staff person to be responsible for responding to COVID-19 concerns, putting robust systems in place for communicating about COVID-19 exposures and transmission, and conducting virtual training, if possible, of coaches, officials, and staff on all safety protocols. And finally, if feasible, conducting daily health checks, such as temperature screening or symptom checking, of coaches, officials, staff, and players, and doing this safely, respectfully, and in accordance with any applicable privacy laws and regulations. And finally, the fourth area that our considerations cover is preparing for if and when someone gets sick. So when this happens, youth sports programs should consider ensuring that coaches, staff, Officials, players, and families know that sick individuals should not attend youth sports activities. 
establishing procedures for safely transporting anyone who is sick to their home or to a healthcare facility, immediately notifying local health officials, youth sports program staff, umpires, officials, and families if anyone on the team has been diagnosed with COVID-19 while maintaining that person's confidentiality and not identifying who they are, advising those who have had close contact with a person diagnosed with COVID-19 to stay home and self-monitor for symptoms, advising sick individuals about home isolation and how to know when it is safe for them to end their home isolation. Sick coaches, staff members, umpires, officials, or players should not return until they have met CDC's criteria to discontinue home isolation. And lastly, closing off areas used by a sick person and not using these areas until after cleaning and disinfecting them. So in sum, there are many things that youth sports leagues can do to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 among their athletes and their families. Thanks very much, Dr. Darty, and thanks Dr. Wester for the opening remarks. We'll now move to questions and answers. Um, so we will start with one question that's come up frequently um, that some organizations have heard that there are recommendations for different places to open in phases. And the question is, should youth sports also reopen in phases? And this question is for Dr. Darty. Yes, we have absolutely heard this question many times and it's a great one. CDC's considerations don't specifically address a phased approach to reopening youth sports. But again, all decisions about scaling up should be made locally in collaboration with local health officials who can help determine levels of COVID-19 community transmission and the capacities of the local public health system and healthcare system. Great, thanks. Um, and so I know our guidance doesn't include specific recommendations for different sports, but we do see the question come up quite a bit as to whether some sort of sports are safer than others. Can you speak to that? Sure. This is a great question, and I know one that a lot of coaches, parents, and children are trying to figure out right now, especially since summer is starting. As I noted in my remarks, a general principle to follow is the more people a child interacts with, the physical closeness of the interaction, the longer that interaction, and the more sharing of equipment there is by multiple players, the higher the risk of COVID-19 spread. Therefore, the risk of COVID-19 exposure and spread is likely going to be different depending on the type of activity that you're talking about. Activities that require close interaction and the sharing of equipment will likely carry a higher risk of exposure and spread than activities that can be done alone or with smaller groups and those that don't require the sharing of equipment. Sports that require frequent closeness between players may make it more difficult to maintain social distancing compared to sports where players are not close to each other and therefore may present increased risk for COVID-19 spread. For close contact sports like wrestling or basketball, play may be modified to safely increase distance between players. Uh, for example, players could focus on individual skill building or conditioning instead of competition or players can limit the time they spend close to others by playing full contact only in game time situations, or leagues can choose to decrease the number of competitions during a season. So those are just a few strategies to think about. Great, thank you. Um, so another question that we are getting is that if someone who is in youth sports is diagnosed with COVID-19, who needs to be notified and how would one go about doing that? Sure, that's, that's really important to think about as sports are ramping up. Sports leagues and teams should work with local health officials to develop a reporting system. For example, it could be something as simple as a letter that youth sports organizations can use to notify health officials as well as anyone who came into close contact with a person who was diagnosed with COVID-19. Thanks. Um, so our next question is for Dr. Murphy, um, and we've gotten a lot of questions about 
recent news that the virus might not actually spread from people touching surfaces and people wondering if that's true. Um, and do we still need to clean and disinfect surfaces and um, how do we do that? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. So um, CDC's guidance regarding cleaning and disinfecting surfaces has not changed. So we know COVID-19 is a new disease and we're still learning a lot about how it spreads. Uh, we know that it may be possible that a person um, can get COVID-19 by touching a surface or an object that has the virus on it and then touching their own uh, mouth, nose, or maybe even their eyes. Um, but we know this is not thought to be the main way that the virus spreads, but again, we're still learning about this. So CDC recommends routinely cleaning and disinfecting uh, frequently touched surfaces, and this is still one of the best ways to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So there's a couple of things I wanna um, just uh, mention when we talk about cleaning and disinfecting um, objects that children use. So first there's some terminology to be familiar with. So cleaning means using soap and water to remove dirt and debris. Um, and this can also decrease how much of the virus is on the surface or the object. So cleaning should always be done first before using either a sanitizer or a disinfectant. So a sanitizer is a product that reduces the amount of germs on surfaces to levels that are considered safe by public health codes or other regulations. So sanitizers are really used for toys that children may place in their mouths. Um, and it's also used on food contact surfaces. And then there's disinfectant. So a disinfectant is a product that destroys or inactivates germs on objects or surfaces. So CDC recommends the use of disinfectants uh, that are listed on uh, the Environmental Protection Agency's list in. So this list includes about 400 disinfectants that are effective against the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, and just, just to remember that disinfectants should not be used on objects that children uh, might, be, might be placing in their mouths, um, as many of these can be toxic if they are swallowed. So in terms of frequency of cleaning and disinfecting or sanitizing shared objects that children use, um, really the, the first thing to think about is identify any of these objects that cannot be cleaned or sanitized or disinfected and really just take those out of use. Um, overall, we just recommend that equipment should be frequently cleaned and then sanitized or disinfected. And this is ideally between use by different children. Um, so again, you want to clean with soap and water, rinse, sanitize, or disinfect with one of these EPA registered products, uh, rinse again and air dry. Um, I also just wanted to note that there's a couple of safety precautions when it comes to cleaning and disinfecting. Um, so these products um, should not be used in close proximity to children and it's important to make sure you have adequate ventilation um, while you're doing the cleaning or sanitizing or disinfecting. Um, just to prevent children or others from inhaling any toxic fumes. And of course, make sure that these materials are kept um, secure and out of the reach of children. And then again, just important to note that um, it's, you should follow the manufacturer's instructions for all of these products. So this includes what concentration to use, what type of application method, how long the product should remain on the surface, and make sure that you use um, proper personal protective equipment for applying these products. So you can find more information on cleaning and disinfecting um, uh, toys or um, other surfaces that um, children may be exposed to in CDC's guidance for child care programs that remain open. So there's a, there's a link to that um, that we can provide to you. And it's also, you can find that just on um, CDC's um, website. Great, thank you, Dr. Murphy. Um, now a question for Dr. Darty, um, one that we are seeing a lot, um, is do you recommend that players who are playing wear, face cloth, wear cloth face coverings during play? This is definitely a hot topic in youth sports right now, as you have noted. And as I, as I mentioned above, face coverings may be challenging for players and particularly for younger players to wear while playing sports. Face coverings should be worn, of course, by coaches, youth sports staff, officials, parents, and spectators as much as possible. And cloth face coverings are most important when physical distancing is difficult, and that's something to remember. 
People wearing face covering should be reminded to not touch their face covering and to wash their hands frequently. Information should be provided to all participants, youth and adults on the proper use, removal and washing of cloth face coverings. And finally, I wanna stress again, as we've mentioned that cloth face covering should not be placed on babies or children younger than two years old. Anyone who has trouble breathing or is unconscious, anyone who is incapacitated or otherwise unable to remove the cloth face covering without assistance. Th those are just some things to think about as you're making these decisions about cloth face coverings. Thank you, Dr. Darty. Um, a related question, um, although I'll direct this one to Dr. Murphy, um, is should children wear face coverings while they are swimming or playing in the water? Yeah, that's a great question. So we just uh, recently released some considerations for public pools, hot tubs, and water playgrounds. And there we, we really um, want to make sure to note that um, a mask should be um, should be considered in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. And so this is especially um, in areas where there's significant community-based transmission. However, uh, cloth face coverings should not be worn while in the water. So we know that these can be difficult to breathe through when they're wet. Um, uh, and just again, just in, to, to reiterate that these cloth face coverings should not be placed on children under the age of two or anyone who has trouble breathing or um, otherwise isn't able to um, remove the face covering without assistance. Thank you. So another question um, for you, Dr. Murphy, that sort of builds on the question that you answered before um, about disinfecting is, if we have rec if CDC has recommendations about sharing um, equipment and disinfecting sports equipment specifically, like bats, rackets, balls, protective gear, um, or other kinds of equipment. Yes. So, um, in order to decrease the risk of COVID nineteen spread, you can consider really just discouraging sharing of items that are difficult to clean, sanitize, or disinfect. Um, we also think it's um, important not to let players share towels, clothing, or other items, um, especially if they use those to wipe their faces or hands. So uh, one way to do this is to be sure that you have adequate supplies to minimize sharing of high-touch equipment. You can also limit the use of supplies and equipment to one group of players at a time and then make sure you can clean and disinfect those supplies and equipment between use. Um, so we, we recommend cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces on or around the field, the court, uh, the play surface, um, at least daily, or in between use as much as possible and as much as feasible. So shared objects and equipment like balls, bats, um, gymnastics equipment, protective gear, should be cleaned and disinfected between, um, between each indi individual if that's possible. Um, so one way to think about doing this, because I know this is challenging and, and there's a lot of questions and concerns, um, it's important to develop a schedule for doing this cleaning um, and disinfection. And again, I just wanna make sure that um, everyone um, is aware to, to make sure that there's safe and correct use and storage of these disinfectants and really making sure that these are, are kept away from children. Um, again, EPA's list in um, has about 400 products um, that are effective against SARS-CoV-2 and, and it has a, a, a great interface to figure out how to, um, to search through these. I know there's been some questions about that. You can get a lot of information if you go to that website. Um, another uh, consideration is to identify an adult staff member or a volunteer that can kind of help with this cleaning and disinfection um, of these objects and equipment. Um, it's, you know, particularly important for this shared equipment um, or these frequently touched surfaces. Great, thank you. Um, and another question about um, disinfection, although this time related to um, what disinfect, what practices should take place after if someone is diagnosed with COVID-19 who has been inside of that space. And 
um, this is specifically related to indoor spaces. Sure, so we don't know how long the air inside a room occupied by someone with confirmed COVID-19 remains potentially infectious. Um, we do have some guidance for cleaning and disinfecting community facilities, so that includes schools and daycare centers. Um, after someone with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 has been in the facility. Um, so for indoor areas, um, consider factors such as the size of the room and the ventilation system uh, design. So this could include the flow rate or the location of the supply and exhaust vents um, when you're deciding how long to close off rooms or areas that have been used by ill persons um, before you begin this disinfection step. Um, Take, uh, take steps to improve ventilation in an area um, or room where someone was ill or suspected to be ill. Um, that will help, help shorten the time um, it takes uh, for their respiratory droplets to be removed from the air. So in general, we're recommending at least um, 24 hours before you um, come in and do your cleaning and disinfecting. Um, although um, if, if you aren't able to do that, really just waiting as long as you possibly can. Great, thank you. Um, so this is a really big question that's been coming quite up quite a lot given the nature of youth sports and um, the way that children interact with each other. So Dr. Darty, does CDC have any recommendations for how to keep six feet between players during practice or competitions? Yes, we do. So as you noted, CDC does encourage social distancing and youth sports programs if that's feasible. And there are a plethora of strategies to do this. So I'm just going to, I'm going to list a couple and we have a, a full list on our website if you want to refer to that. But an important thing that you can think about doing is identifying an adult staff member or volunteer to help main social distancing among youth coaches, umpires and spectators. Um, if state and local directors allow for spectators, of course. You could space players at least six feet apart on the field while participating in the sport. Uh, for example, during warm up or skill building activities or simulation drills. You can discourage unnecessary physical contact such as high fives, handshakes, fist bumps and hugs. You could create uh, physical distance between players when you're explaining drills or the rules of the game. So before they have started engaging in these drills, or the game. Uh, if you find that keeping physical distance is difficult with players in competition or in group practice, you can consider relying on individual skill work and drills instead. You can encourage players to wait in their cars with their guardians until just before the beginning of a practice, the warm up or a game, instead of forming in a group and socializing. You can limit the use of carpools or van pools. And um, when you're riding in an, in, a, in an automobile to a sporting event, encourage players to ride to the sport event with persons living in the same household. If practices or competition facilities are shared, consider increasing the amount of time between practices and competitions to allow for one group to leave before another group enters the facility. This allows for time for cleaning and disinfecting between practices and competitions. You could consider providing physical guides such as signs and tape on floors or the playing fields to make sure that coaches and players remain at least six feet apart. You could place players in small groups with dedicated coaches or staff and make sure that each group of players and coaches avoids mixing with other groups. Teams might consider staging intra-team scrimmages instead of playing games with other teams in order to minimize exposure between players. You could think about staggering arrival and drop-off times or locations for each cohort to limit contact between groups and direct contact with parents as much as possible. This could include increasing the amount of time, again, between practices and competitions to allow for time or one group to depart before the next group enters the facility. And then finally, uh, during times when players are not actively participating in practice or competition, attention should be given to maintaining social distancing by increasing space between players on the sideline, the dugout or bench, 
Additionally, coaches can encourage athletes to use downtime for individual skill building work or cardiovascular conditioning rather than staying clustered together and, and chit chatting. Great, thank you, Dr. Darty. Another question about social distancing is how does it apply to interactions between coaches and staff when typically um, that requires pretty close interaction? So for example, um, coaches spotting gymnastics or, um, or other reasons to be close to the athlete. Sure. Yeah, we've also heard this question um, in regards to athletic trainers, too. So this is really important. Um, sports that require frequent closeness between players and coaches or athletic trainers may make it more difficult to maintain social dis distancing. That's absolutely true. Youth sports programs may consider focusing on individual skill building and conditioning for the time being, activities that don't require close interaction, or they may decide that it is impossible to avoid this close interaction and thus decide that the coaches and trainers wear cloth face coverings when interacting with the youth athletes. Thank you. Um, so another question that we have is related to families and friends who are coming to watch sporting events. And people are just asking simply the question, should these events be canceled altogether? Sure, that makes sense. Um, as, as we've laid out in the considerations, which you can find online, youth sports leagues and teams should avoid group events such as games, competitions, or social gatherings where spacing of at least six feet between people can't be maintained. And youth sports organizations should also cons consider limiting any non-essential visitors spectators, volunteers, and activities involving external groups or organizations as much as possible. Uh, this is especially true with individuals that are not coming from the same local geographic area, like the same community, town, city, or county. Thank you. Um, so in addition to just um, individual sports that happen um, you know, once or twice a week, we've also gotten questions about um, running large sports camps and if that is feasible um, this summer. Sure, great question. And, and we did hold a, a call earlier in the week um, about other kinds of camps and some of the information that was provided there would be relevant as well. And we have information posted on our website about summer camps in general. But um, in terms of sports camps, we encourage you again to consult with your state and local health officials to discuss the particular situation in your community. Each community is going to have unique needs and circumstances, so it's difficult to give one piece of advice that is right for every community. We do know, however, that the more people a, a, a child interacts with, the physical closeness of that interaction and the longer that interaction, the higher risk of COVID-19 spread, as I've said before. But given that, there are several actions that a sports camp administration, administrator could take to reduce risk. They could prioritize outdoor activities instead of indoor activities. Coaches could focus on individual skill building drills, which allow for more social distancing. Alternatively, coaches may also put athletes into small groups that remain together and work through stations rather than switching groups or mixing groups. There's also less risk if all athletes are from the same local geographic area. In some, there are several things that a sports camp could do to decrease the risk of COVID-19 spread. In addition, as I mentioned, um, CDC has developed resources including a youth camps decision tool and youth and summer camps considerations, which are available on our website and can really help guide the decisions about uh, youth sports camps as well. Thanks, Dr. Darty. Um, so another question for you, and it's, um, it's if you have advice for health sports programs can encourage um, the six foot social distancing when it's removed, if that requirement is removed during competition, but is still being asked of spectators and those athletes that are waiting to play? 
yeah, great question. So I, I think we, we've uh, pointed this out um, earlier, but the, the more people a, a, a kid interacts with and how long that interaction is, especially if it's, it's um, for a long time, the higher the risk of this, the um, COVID-19 spread is. Therefore, youth sports programs should consider encouraging social distancing for players at all times. And if organizations are not able to keep in place safety measures during competition, for example, maintaining this social distancing of having kids keep six feet apart from one another at all times, they may consider dropping down a level and limiting participation to within team competition only. For example, having scrimmages between members of the same team or team-based practices only. Similarly, if organizations are unable to put in place safety measures during team-based activities, they may choose instead to do individual or at-home activities instead of having the kids all come to one place. Youth sports programs can also consider encouraging social distancing among those athletes waiting to play and for spectators. So your program could limit any non-essential visitor, visitors, spectators, volunteers, and activities involving external groups or organizations as much as possible, especially again, when individuals are coming from a different local geographic area. Thanks. Um, we have another question for you, Dr. Darty. Um, this one is top of mind for many people, um, including myself, who I'm thinking about this for my own children. Um, but how realistic is it really to expect young children to be able to follow these social distancing rules and, um, and other guidance? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, and we do think that older kids are probably going to be better able to follow directions for social distancing and take other protective actions like not sharing water bottles. Um, of course, you know, you know your kids best and perhaps you have a younger child who can who can follow these directions and that's great. Um, but in general, we, we do think that there that age is going to be a major factor in how likely the kids are able to follow the social distancing recommendations. So if feasible, a coach, parent, or other caregiver can help make sure that athletes maintain proper social distancing when they're playing their sports or at practice. For younger athletes, youth sports programs may ask parents or other household members to monitor their own kids and make sure that they follow social distancing and take other protective actions for example, younger children could sit with parents or caregivers instead of in a, in a dugout or in a group area. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, another question that has come in is related to coaches and officials and how should, um, how should youth sports organizations approach um, minimizing the risk for older, um, older coaches and officials or people who are other people who are at higher risk for getting seriously ill from COVID-19. Sure. So we, we know that the risk of severe illness from COVID-19 increases with age and, and also that people of any age with certain medical conditions are also at, at higher risk for severe illness. So you could offer options for individuals at higher risk such as virtual coaching and in-home drills that limit their exposure risk. Uh, you could also limit youth sports participation to staff and youth who live in the same local geographic area to reduce the risk of spread from areas with higher levels of COVID-19. That's something to keep in mind. Great, um, thank you. Another question for you, Dr. Darty. Um, so you talked about, um, well, Dr. Murphy talked about cleaning indoor settings earlier. Um, there's been some questions about if the six foot social distancing rule applies to both indoor and outdoor settings, given that many youth sports, of course, will be played in an outdoor setting. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. Um, generally, yes, but there is some evidence to suggest that prioritizing outdoor over indoor activities is recommended in order to decrease the risk of COVID-19 transmission. But as much as possible, 
uh, we're, we're recommending social distancing in, in all types of settings. Okay, thank you. This is um, another follow up to one of our earlier questions. Um, so you talked about sort of reporting if we find out if um, groups, organizations find out that a child or staff has become sick with COVID-19. What are other steps that sports youth sports organizations should take if somebody is diagnosed with COVID-19? Yeah, that's, that's really important to start thinking about before the activities resume. Uh, what, what do you do if one of your kids uh, or coaches gets COVID-19? So there are several steps that you can take. Um, first, make sure that coaches, staff, officials, players, and families know that sick individuals should not attend the youth sports activities and that they should notify the youth sports officials, um, for example, the COVID-19 point of contact for your program, if they or their child or anyone in their family becomes sick with COVID-19 symptoms, test positive for COVID-19, or even if they've been exposed to someone suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19. It's also important to close off areas used by a sick person and to not use these areas until after cleaning and disinfecting them. Um, and for outdoor areas, this includes surfaces or shared objects in the area if that's applicable. In accordance with state and local laws and regulations, youth sports organizations should notify their local health officials, uh, their youth program sports staff, umpires or other sports officials and families immediately of anyone with COVID-19 while maintaining that person's confidentiality in accordance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And finally, if any coaches, staff members, umpires, sports officials, or players get sick, they should not return until they have met CDC's criteria to discontinue home isolation, which is laid out on our website. Great, thank you. Um, now a question that um, has been asked by lots of coaches um, and youth sports organization administrators is should sports programs test all athletes before they come to practice or play in a game? Yes, this is, this is a great question and one in which the, the thinking around it and the uh, guidance and recommendations are, are changing. So CDC has released a framework guidance for reopening schools, which could also be considered for decision making around youth sports. That can be found on our website. And this guidance is based on levels of COVID-19 community transmission and the capacities of the local public health and healthcare systems. And then on May 20th, just two days ago, CDC also released additional considerations for local jurisdictions for school reopening. So in these guidance documents, CDC recommends schools take mitigation approaches such as using cloth face coverings, social distancing, increased cleaning and home isolation for symptomatic students or those who have come into contact with someone who has COVID-19. But CDC does not currently recommend that viral or, or serologic test results be used for decisions of admitting or excluding persons from settings like schools or workplaces. Again, youth sports organizations could refer to these recommendations as they're thinking about their plans. It's important that, um, that, I, that I say that viral tests can only determine potential infection at a single point in time and may miss cases in the early stages of infection. Positive test results may be more likely to be false positives in communities with low rates of community transmission. And while the presence of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies likely indicates a prior infection, until the durability and duration of immunity is established, it cannot be assumed that individuals with truly positive antibody test results are protected from future infection. People who test positive by serologic tests should continue to follow CDC recommendations to prevent infection with SARS-CoV-2. The testing of students or youth athletes for COVID-19 may be appropriate in the limited context of case investigations and contact tracing, 
for example, following the identification of a positive case in a student or school staff member, CDC contact tracing guidance encourages states with available resources to test uh, high-risk contacts of the confirmed case. Thank you. Um, we now have another question for Dr. Murphy um, regarding if, if SARS-CoV um, can survive in clothes, specifically in active wear. So, this is another area where we just don't have a whole lot of data yet, um, especially around survival and on very specific things like different types of clothing. But we do think it's unlikely that there's prolonged survival um, in active wear clothing. So, um, some previous studies have shown an activation on different surfaces um, occurs usually from within hours to days. Um, so, we expect that's probably the same for these types of materials. Um, so to date, we don't have any documented cases of transmission of the virus from clothing or shoes, but again, we are um, closely watching um, the studies that are coming out and we'll provide updates as those do. Thank you. Um, the next question is related again to cloth face coverings and people are asking um, that we understand that um, babies and children younger than two and anyone who has trouble breathing or is unconscious or anyone who is otherwise incapacitated or can't take off the face cover um, should not wear a mask. Are there other drawbacks to people wearing masks and specifically to um, youth athletes who might be wearing these face coverings? Oh, uh, sure. And for uh, Dr. Darty. Yeah, sure, I can take that. Um, the, the, the drawbacks to cloth face coverings, um, which as you mentioned, Christy, is the type of mask recommended by the CDC, is that they can make it more difficult for, uh, for some individuals to breathe. Um, they may cause people to touch their face more often as they adjust the placement of the mask. And they can, of course, get moistened uh, with sweat or respiration after someone's been wearing it for a while. Um, so those are the, the main drawbacks to a mask, and there are a couple of things that youth sports programs could do or parents could help um, as they're uh, experimenting with cloth face coverings with their kids. So, you know, if, if a youth sports program or a family decides that they want to put in place rules regarding wearing cloth face coverings, it might be helpful to experiment with several different kinds of cloth face coverings, uh, different shapes, different fabrics, to ensure comfort and fit. And uh, remember, cloth face coverings are most essential when social distancing of at least six feet is difficult to maintain. Great, thank you. Um, so Dr. Darty, you talked about um, sort of cohorting groups of athletes. Um, is there a recommended maximum number of athletes per coach, per coach or per cohort? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. I know, it, and it's, a, it's a, a question that a lot of coaches and parents are wondering about, whether we have to set a, a maximum number. And um, just to explain a little bit more about the idea of cohorting, um, it's to try to limit the number of other people that each individual is exposed to. So if one person happens to contract COVID-19, then the spread will be confined to the cohort that the infected individual belongs to and, and hopefully stop there. This can be done in youth sports if that's feasible. Perhaps one coach will be responsible for six or 10 youth athletes and another coach will be responsible for a separate group of six to 10 youth athletes. But at this time, there is not a recommendation for group size or a ratio of athletes to coach. CDC still, of course, encourages that youth sports programs engage in social distancing as much as possible. Cohorting would be an alternative, but a slightly higher risk strategy. Thank you. Um, sort of related to that, how many kids should be allowed in a gym or weight room or a sort of smaller facility at one time? 
sure that that's a good question and I think my answer is probably going to be pretty similar. So the CDC has not set any specific numbers uh, for these situations for gyms, weight rooms, or other facilities um, in terms of sports program attendance. In general, the, the number that is chosen should allow for appropriate social distancing or, or cohorting as decided by the sports program. And this will depend on whether the activity is indoors or outdoors the age of the players and the level of spread of COVID-19 in the individual locality and also the type of sport played. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time to address one more question. Um, and that is, there's been a lot of questions about if athletes should wear gloves during sports games and athletes who wouldn't typically wear gloves. Sure. Yeah, I can I can take that one as well. Um, no, there's currently no recommendation for children to wear gloves during sports games. Um, the, the health promoting behaviors that are recommended are things that we've already talked about, like frequent hand washing, covering coughs and sneezes with a tissue or inside of an elbow and social distancing. So no gloves. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Darty, Dr. Murphy, and Dr. Wester. Um, this has been very helpful. Um, I'd like to just call everybody's attention to um, the resources um, that are um, on the slides, or that have been on the slides. Um, all of the resources that were um, noted on this call today are in these slides, are on those resource slides and can also be found um, on CDC's COVID-19 website. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you for all of your, all that you are doing to protect people's health, um, especially children who are engaging in youth sports and um, hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you.